So welcome to Financial Reporting and Analysis. What we're going to do today is do a little bit of introduction. So um, I'll tell you who I am, where I'm from, the staff that are teaching on the subject um, together with me. I'll get you guys to quickly introduce yourselves so I know roughly what your background is. Then we'll spend probably about the first half an hour after that talking about the structure of the subject and what we need from, oh, sorry, um, what we need from you and what you expect from us in terms of assessment and resources and so forth. Hopefully that will take us up until about 7 o'clock. As a general rule, when I take classes, I try to give you a break every hour or so for about 10 minutes. The theoretical idea is you go out and get coffee out of there, but if you've tried any of the coffee out there, it's actually quite rubbish. Um, so if you're really desperate to stay awake, I suggest before the class go down to either Art of Foods down on Key Street or the UTS Hub down in Block A. Um, in fact, I pro uh, strangely enough, I prefer the university for coffee. Usually university coffee is crap, but here it's actually okay. Um, so we'll have a break every hour or so. Then what I intend to do in hours two and three, I was hoping that I'd get through the first material today and then move on to talking about debits and credits. For those of you who are a little bit rusty with that, I don't think I'm going to get onto debits and credits. So based on what your background is, whether you've done AMD or not, that may or may not be important to you. What we do have in this subject are drop-in sessions, and those drop-in sessions start next week. I'll tell you a little bit, bit about them later. But in about two weeks, I'll spend some time in the drop-in session uh, discussing dro um, debits and credits and net present values for people who are rusty or, or for whom those concepts are entirely new. Well, hopefully that shouldn't be any of you. Okay, so there are other resources. If you're um, feeling that you're not 100% prepared, then come along to the drop-ins. Anyway, I'll talk about that a little later. Um, what is important to understand is that this subject has a number of themes going through it, and only one of those themes is a technical theme. So by the time you finish the subject, you should, <coughs> wrong keyboard, um, you should have a good understanding of um, regulation. So the rules that we apply in the topic areas that we cover in this subject leases, tax, and so forth. In other words, you will know how to record certain types of economic events. Right? That's the technical part of it. But underlying that, accounting rules, unfortunately, are not totally objective in the sense of physics or maths, where they're abstract and, and they're not really questioned. Um, accounting rules tend to come out of a political process. And so sometimes those rules are inconsistent with each other, in fact, quite frequently. Um, that are inconsistent with some of the basic principles that we apply or pretend to apply. So we need to understand that inconsistency and the best way of looking that, at that is through a prism of incentives. What are people's motivations? Because accounting gives you choices and people tend to exploit those choices. Some of those choices get exploited because accounting rules give you choices. Some of those choices get exploited because when accounting rules are set, People lobby accounting standard setters to get the rules that they want. And that's why we've ended up with some rules that are, you know, if you're walking off the street and you see we're recording something as an asset, most normal people would say, hang on, that's not an asset. Why are we recording that? And the reason is because accounting is the outcome of a political process. Okay, so it's important that you understand that, and we'll talk about that today. Uh, sorry, I keep thinking I'm on the main computer. I'm on the. So let me just introduce. Uh, the team that's teaching, and then we'll just go through getting you to introduce yourselves. I'm Robert Trankowski. Just call me Robert. Please don't use any titles. Please do not try to pronounce my surname, because you'll get it wrong. My brother gets it wrong, so uh, he's got the same surname. So um, just call me Robert. Um, my extension number is 3736. I'm in room C325, so that's two levels down over in C block here in this building. Um, if you want to contact me, best if it's personal issues about your enrolment in the subject or you're having some difficulties or you need to meet, then email me. And if you email me, include the subject code, 22748, somewhere in the subject line. Okay, because otherwise it might not get through my filters and I might find it in February 2015 in my spam mailbox. Okay, so please it's important that you include the subject code. If you are communicating with us about 
the subject matter that's covered in, in the classes, then please go on to UTS online. There are some discussion boards there. I'll show you all that in a few minutes. Um, and I, we would prefer that you ask questions there, mainly because if you've got the question, somebody else has probably got the same question. So that probably means A, somebody else has answered it already, and the answer is already there, or B, if I answer it for you, I'll be simultaneously answering it for another person. Um, it can get really annoying if 20 people ask me the same question in the space of five minutes. I'm writing the same response. Actually, what gets really annoying is if one person spams all of the lecturers at the same time, we all answer the same question, and then we're meeting for a coffee and we realize we've each spent 20 minutes um, answering the same student's question. So it's easier if we can do that on UTS online. Okay, Stephen Lim is taking, actually I can't recall which classes, so let me just go back to the schedule. Um, I haven't copied it across. Okay, Stephen Lim is taking, well hang on, I know which classes Helen is taking. Helen is taking, I think, Wednesday morning, Thursday morning, Friday morning, and Tuesday afternoon. And I'm pretty sure that's right. Oh, actually, it's in the outline. So if you have a look, um, just after the schedule, there's a list of who takes which classes. And yes, Helen, Wednesday morning, Thursday morning, Friday morning, and Tuesday afternoon. I'm taking Tuesday morning and this class, and Stephen is taking all the remaining classes. Now, I do know that students tend to um, lecture a shop early in semester, so people do go to different classes. We encourage you to do that if you want to, to have a look who suits your style. Um, you know, some people like me and hate Stephen, other people like Stephen and hate me. So it's important that you feel comfortable going to a class where um, the way the person is presenting is a way that you can understand. Okay, yeah? 9 a.m. Horrible, 9 a.m. Um, I'm usually in bed at 9 a.m. This is not a normal time for me. I usually get up at 10 and I go to bed at 3. 9 a.m. is not a normal time for teaching. Um, this is my lunch time now, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> I can deal with that. Um, okay, so that's who's taking the classes. Uh, we each have consultation hours. If you go to UTS online, um, staff information is up there. So if you go to UTS online for uh, the FRA area, hang on, I've had to find it. Uh, down there in contacts, we have staff contact details. Oh, hang on, I need to turn off the edit. Sorry. Uh, they're only the people teaching this semester. So that's me. My consultation hours are 3 o'clock to 5 o'clock on Tuesdays. So essentially what that means is for me, I'm guaranteed to be in my office at that time. Um, but if you want to see me other times, that's fine, but you need to make an appointment. With one exception, I'm not here next week. Um, I'm overseas at a conference next week. So for all of the remaining semester, I'll be here. I'll be here in this class except for next week. Next week, Helen will be taking this class. Um, Helen's consultations are Thursday, 12 to 2. Um, once more, if you want to see her outside those times, make an appointment. You know, we're reasonably flexible. Um, I'm the sort of person that can't work at home, so I'm here most, of, most days, um, usually in the evenings. Helen tends to work at home a bit more, but if you make an appointment, she could see you. Um, Stephen's consultations are 5 to 6 on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So if you want to talk to him, He's available just before this class. Okay, so our contact details are up there. That's introduction, so let me uh, lead into what we're going to be covering. I'll just do that briefly for the moment, then I'll talk a little bit about the resources that we've got in the subject. Um, and we're coming up to a break. Oh, oh, no, we're not. Sorry, that was the second hand, not the minute hand. We have time. Okay, so what we're going to see in this subject, as I've already said, is we're going to see accounting rules relating to a bunch of topics. And if you have a look at the next slide, there's you know, an overview that shows you most of the basic stuff that we're going to look at up until week seven. So revenues, accounting, sorry, revenues, assets, liabilities, and then a few more complicated specific topics, um, employee benefits, foreign currency, financial instruments, leases, and tax. So by the time we finish this subject, you should have a reasonable understanding of accounting regulation, or you should understand those rules and you should know how to apply them um, in relation to those economic events. Um, yeah, and we do have a constructions contract one in, in revenues as well. Okay, so we're going to understand that. 
one of the problems that we have with accounting, as I've already said, is it tends to be, uh, it tends to inconsistently apply principles. And the main reason for that is because people have different incentives in different circumstances to apply those rules differently and to lobby on those rules. So an example of um, where incentives kick in. Let's say that you're a manager of a company. Um, that company is listed, so you've got a share price out there. There are shareholders who are interested in your performance. Um, you're working in that company as a CEO, and you know that in two years you're going to quit. Either you're going to retire or you're going to move on to another company. Okay, now obviously, if those are your interests, that's your intention, then you want to make sure that for the time you're in that company, you're going to get as much reward as you possibly can out of that company. And generally, you get rewarded for profit. Okay? Now, it doesn't matter whether you get an explicit bonus contract, um, whether you are issued with some shares. If those things depend on the amount of profit that you make, you have an incentive to increase the amount of profit you report. Even if you are not explicitly rewarded for profit, in other words, there's no contract that gives you a percentage of profit or a bonus, you still have that incentive. Right? If the profit is low or negative, there's a greater chance you're going to lose your job earlier. So at the margin, there is an incentive to increase profit. The problem is reported profits that you present to shareholders are the outcome of two things. One is economic reality, and two, the accounting processes that transform that reality into financial reports. So an example that hopefully most of you would feel comfortable with is depreciation. I mean, if I've got an asset that I'm going to depreciate, I have to make a bunch of estimates. I know what its cost is. I know at the end it's probably going to be worth zero. But in what pattern does it get to zero? Okay, does it get to zero? Does it get used up quickly or does it get used up slowly? So if you're using a laptop computer, say, in a, in a normal office business, you might say that laptop computer is going to last four years. In fact, for tax reasons, that's what you would say. No, sorry, three years. Um, so you would say a laptop computer has a three-year life. So if you buy it for $100, you're going to have a depreciation expense each year of 33, 33, 33, and then it's down to zero. Okay. Now, if you're working on a mine site, you're operating a mine, and you're giving laptops to your engineers, with all the dust and all the stuff, it may be that laptop computers only last a year. Right? So in that case, the useful life is going to be a year. So your expense should be 100, zero, zero. Okay, now, in some circumstances, you can establish what appropriate depreciation is by looking at past experience. Okay, but you've got to have that experience. In some cases, you might not have evidence that tells you how long this thing is going to last. So you're basically, in calculating depreciation, you're making an estimate of how long that thing is going to last. You're basically saying, is it going to go down slowly? So the expense in the first year will be that much in the second year will be that much, in the third year will be that much, or is it going to depreciate quickly so the expense in the first year is that much? But that's a judgment call. You have to make that judgment based on your experience and how you think this asset is going to be used. Now, the assumption is that when those judgments are made, we're just you know, judging, making the judgment based on providing good information to shareholders to help them make decisions. But it's really difficult for somebody to say, hang on, I don't think that computer is going to last three years. I think it's going to last two and a half. Or I think it's going to last two. Especially if they're an outsider and they don't necessarily know a lot about what's going on inside this particular business. So ultimately, you have a choice that you can make. Obviously, if the choice is going to be really crazy, like you're saying it's depreciating over 100 years, <laughs> they're going to say, hey, you're wacky assuming they have access to that information. But at the margin, you have some flexibility with how you decide to depreciate it. Now, if your incentive relates to the fact that you're planning to only work there for two years, you would prefer to have as little expense in the years where you're still working and as much expense as in the years after you go away. Right? So you would have an incentive to depreciate that equipment slowly. Now, the reason I've used depreciation as an example is it's something you should be familiar with. But we're going to see other examples in this subject where you have those choices. And those choices basically are, whenever you say, what's the expense for this year? Simultaneously, you're saying, what's the asset at the end of the year? Right? Because the asset is just the, 
part that hasn't become an expense yet. And similarly, we can do the same thing with revenues and liabilities. Whenever we're making a choice about our asset, we're making a choice about, sorry, whenever we're making a choice about the balance sheet, we're also making a choice about the income statement. And we have incentives to try to make profit appear large. Okay, if we're managers, we're rewarded for profit, implicitly or explicitly. So, there may not always be that flexibility, but that flexibility drives some reporting behaviour at the margin. Okay, so what does that mean? It means there are two circumstances where incentives are going to come into play. Firstly, if you've got an accounting standard that gives you choices, you will probably make the choices that make you look good. Okay, that's inside the company. But secondly, if the accounting standard setters are looking to put in new rules, and these rules are likely to make your life hard or they're likely to change your numbers a lot, you might have a very strong incentive to lobby the standard setters to get a rule that either is written differently or a rule that gives you more choice. So the irony about accounting rules is they're called accounting standards. The assumption when you hear the word standard is that everybody does things the same way. But of course, we know that accounting standards give people choices. And there are some reasonable reasons why people might need choices, but nonetheless, if choices are there, and making those choices is up to people's judgment, we know that some people will exploit that ability to make judgment, okay? because their personal incentives drive that. So what we're trying to achieve with accounting is we're trying to achieve good information for the users of financial statements. Ultimately, they're the ones that are making decisions. But we know that accountants and users of accounting information and preparers of accounting information have incentives, and those incentives are driven by self-interest. Right? So when we come up to um, when we come up to a standard, well, towards the end of semester, when we look at leases we're going to come up to an example like this. Leases is a standard, I mean, if I ask you what is a lease, and you don't know anything about accounting, your first response would be, a lease is just a rental agreement, right? I fly, fly down to Tasmania, I rent a car for three days, I sign a lease agreement. So if I lease a car for three days, it's clearly an expense, right? I sign it, I pay for three days, credit cash, debit lease expense, no problem. The problem is, though, not all leases are so clear cut. Sometimes a company will go out and say, hang on, why don't I lease a car for all of its useful life? Which is what companies used to do. So let, let's say you want a motor vehicle and you want to use it in your business. And I'll just insert an extra slide here because I need to do a bit of drawing. Can I insert it? No. Apologies. Okay, I can't insert a slide, so I'm going to draw on the existing slide. Um, let's say that you need a car for your business. Well, let's say you don't have the cash to buy that. You've got two potential choices. If you've got existing assets and liabilities, so this is sort of your balance sheet, assets are balanced by liabilities and owner's equity, and you don't have the cash to buy a motor vehicle, what you could do is go out and borrow the cash and then buy the motor vehicle. So what's going to happen? Well, liabilities will go up because you've borrowed some funds and assets will go up because you spend them to buy a car. Okay. Now, the problem with that is liabilities have increased and assets have increased by the same amount. Put yourself in the position of someone who is assessing the risk of this company. If I look at a company and I'm assessing how risky it is, one of the things that I'm going to look at is the ratio of liabilities to assets. Okay? If I tell you there are two companies out there, each has got $100 of assets, but one's got $99 of liabilities, that was as equity is one, the other one's got $1 of liability, equity is 99, which one's the riskier one? The one with more liabilities. Okay, now why is that the case? It's the case because we know that profit isn't smooth, profit tends to vary. So with that first company, if you make a profit of minus one, you wipe out all the equity and the company is insolvent. Right? And then the liability guys start losing. Whereas with the company that's got one dollars of liability and ninety-nine of equity, 
You have a profit of minus one, hey, it's not good, but we're still solvent. Still got more assets than liabilities. So when people look at entities, one of the ways they assess risk is they look at the relationship between liabilities and assets. Now, I'm not necessarily going to say that 99 out of 100 is high. What is high and what is low depends on your industry. So if you're operating in, in, as a grocer, you know, coals or woolies, you tend to have very stable profits because people eat no matter whether the economy is doing well or badly. So for them, having you know, 50 or 60% liabilities as a percentage of assets may be safe. For a company with very volatile income, 50 or 60 may be very risky. So what is high and what is low depends on the industry that you're in. Okay, come back to this issue of leasing a car. We know that people use the ratio between liabilities and assets as one of their many risk measures. The ratio of liabilities to assets. Now what happens if you borrow money and you buy that car? You make that ratio bigger. If you add the same amount to both top and bottom, and the ratio is below one when you start with, you're making the ratio bigger. So people looking at your balance sheet from outside, new potential lenders will say, hang on, this company is a little bit riskier than it was before. Okay? So borrowing money and buying assets can make you look a little bit more risky. If you borrow a lot of money and buy a lot of assets, you look a lot more risky. Okay. So let's assume you're a company that's already got a reasonable level of risk and you need a new machine. So your choice is borrow money and buy the machine or before the 1980s, before we had the new leasing rules, they're not so new anymore, what you might do is you might go out for a finance company and you'll say, hang on, I need this machine that's going to last 10 years. Instead of buying it, how about you lease it to me? So what would happen is the machine would come in, you wouldn't legally own it, but you have the machine to use, and you would have a lease that you pay off over 10 years. Right? So it looks like you're renting it. However, think about if you're doing that, and you're going to use up that machine, at the end of 10 years, the company doesn't care about getting it back. So you don't have to go to a machine leasing company. You can go to a finance company. Right? They'll buy the machine, they'll lease it to you. What you're really doing is, you're, if you're going to use the asset for most of its useful life, economically, it's like buying it. Right? Think about the guy who's leasing it to you. What, what's he going to charge you for the lease? Well, he wants his original money back, so the cost of the asset, plus a reasonable rate of return. Well, what's another way of saying reasonable rate of return? Interest. Right? Choose your rate, but interest. So the guy who decides what you're going to repay is going to think about the payments exactly the same way that a bank thinks about a loan. How much did I lend him? How much do I need to get back to get a reasonable rate of return? So the leases will be priced the same way as a loan. And economically, what you've done, economically, you've actually bought the asset. Right? You've got these payments that you can't get out of. What's another word for payments you can't get out of? Liability. Right? You've got this commitment for the 10 years, these payments to make, and you've got this asset you can use. And the only thing that stops it being an asset is the fact that it's got the word lease on it. So it appears like a legal rental. So we're going to see this much later in semester. But when we face circumstances like that, we say, hang on, we know that legally this looks like a rental arrangement, but economically it isn't. Economically, it's dressed up legally as a rental, but economically, it's really a finance and purchase. So what the lease standard does is it says, hang on, some leases, even though they're legally called leases, it's really you borrowing money to buy an asset. Right? It's committing to make payments to a finance company, and in exchange, you get an asset. Now, why would companies enter into a lease? Well, if they enter into a lease, if they don't have to treat it as an asset and liability, they don't have to add anything to their balance sheet. So they don't appear to be more risky. So leasing equipment in the 1970s was a way of stopping you making you look your sorry beep, was a way of stopping your balance sheet looking more risky. So what the accounting standard setters came up with in the early 1980s, they said, "Hang on, we need to look at leases more carefully. Let's look at how much the payments are compared to the value of the asset. How long is the lease for compared to the life of the asset? And if those numbers are high." then it probably isn't a rental arrangement. It's probably really a financing arrangement. So just because it's called a lease, 
instead of being called a loan, doesn't make it any different. Economically, it's the same. You've got a commitment to pay and you've got the use of the asset. So we've got a circumstance there where companies try to avoid the effects on the balance sheet by entering into certain types of contracts. And what the accounting standard said, is, said was, well, hang on, really, this is a financing arrangement. So it should be recorded the same way as any other financing arrangement, a loan and a purchase. So the lease standard basically says we need to be able to tell the difference between one of these finance leases and a lease where I rent a car for three days. Right? Somewhere between those two, there's a dividing line. If I rent a car for 12 years, I rent a car for three days. Somewhere, that stops being a rental and it becomes a financing arrangement. How do we work that out? Why does it matter? Well, if everybody was out there just saying, let's report everything accurately, it wouldn't be an issue. But we know that managers are motivated by the way they're assessed. They're assessed based on what profit they make, and they're assessed based on how risky the business is. So if you called it a lease in the 1970s, your balance sheet wouldn't change. If you called it a loan and a purchase, your balance sheet would change, and you would look a little bit more risky. So that was a way of avoiding the accounting rules, looking less risky. So the accounting rules said, hang on, we better, we, the accounting standards said, said, we better change those rules to record the economic reality. So what we're trying to do with accounting standards is we're trying to deal with this fact that people out there need decent accounting information to help them make decisions. But because incentives drive the way that accountants and CEOs behave, they might not always be getting that good information. So we're trying to restrict companies from certain choices to make sure that companies report as consistently as possible. We'll come back to that. Okay, so what we're going to see in this subject, starting next week, we're going to look at revenue recognition in general, um, and then construction contracts specifically. Then we're going to look at a bunch of asset issues. Um, and if you looked at um, assets in AMD, I don't know whether they cover revaluations or not, but generally when I teach a first year introductory accounting subject, you know, usually we do some creative lying. We hide some reality from you to make the principles easier to understand. So we say things like, when you buy an asset, every asset is originally recorded at cost, and it stays at cost. Well, sometimes that information isn't relevant. And so companies are given choices where they don't have to record assets at cost. In certain circumstances, they're allowed to record them at market value. We never use the word market value. We say fair value, but it's meant to be the same thing. OK, so we're going to see those issues applied different ways in different circumstances um, in the assets topics. Then we're going to look at liabilities, and we're going to talk about what happens with liabilities that might exist but are difficult to record. What do we do with those contingent liabilities? And we're also going to talk about liabilities that are complicated, like employee benefits, superannuation or pension funds or long service leave. Um, you know, when I work at UTS, UTS is promising me that after 10 years I get a three-month holiday. Okay, that's long service leave. Now, how does UTS account for that holiday? It's pretty difficult for them because it's not just, oh, Robert's going to be earning the same amount he earns now 10 years from now, so a three-month holiday is just worth a third of his pay. No, they've got to estimate what, how is my pay going to increase over those 10 years before I take that holiday. What will that really cost them? And if it's far away, maybe we need to calculate a present value of that. So calculating liabilities that are far away, that aren't fixed in dollar terms, involves a bunch of estimates. And in the case of long service leave, there are five different things we're going to have to estimate. OK, so that's basically where we're going topic-wise. Now let's come back to the admin of the subject, um, tell you what we expect from you um, in terms of assessments and the resources that we're going to provide. So mid-semester exam, that's going to happen, I think. By the way, if you've got the course outline, um, after all the at UTS has this formal course outline system where we have to put stuff in and on page, the first page when you open it has all the topics. We put the absolute minimum in there. And the reason is because it's really hard to edit in the online system. Okay? So this tells you what you need to know broadly, but when you get past those first few pages, there's a schedule of topics. And that goes for two pages. It tells you what we cover, and it tells you which readings you need to do. 
and I'll tell you about the text in a few moments. So the mid-semester exam is going to cover all topics from weeks one to six. So right down to the first liabilities topics. And then everything from employee benefits onwards will be covered in the final exam. Um, now I'm going to make a comment in a few moments about theory. Um, the final exam, generally in terms of practical, so in terms of how to record things, journal entries, numbers, the final exam is only going to test you on weeks seven onwards. Seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. However, in terms of theory, the final exam can ask you about anything. Now, let me just clarify what I mean by that. We are not going to ask you specifically a theory question about one of the week two or three um, topics, so say construction contracts, in the final exam. The reason I'm saying that theory can be on all topics is the stuff that we're going to talk about today, the incentives, the information needs that accounting satisfies, this is something that goes all the way through the subject. And in every topic, we're going to come back and talk about incentives, more or less. Okay, so you need to understand that incentive motivation, that incentive structure, so the motivation, the impact of incentives, um, because that's something we can ask you in general at the end of the semester, uh, or it's something we can ask you in relation to specific topics. But if we do ask you that in relation to specific topics in the final exam, it will only be topic seven plus, but we can ask you the general question as well. So in other words, what I'm trying to say there is, in the final exam, topic seven plus, but also today is examinable in the final. Okay, um, so that's the final and the mid-sem. Those will be held during the relevant exam weeks. So um, neither of them have been scheduled yet, but you know that the mid-sem week starts on the 22nd of September. So that's what, in about seven weeks or thereabouts. Um, and the central exam period starts on the 9th of November. Okay. The remaining assessment component is the case study. You're probably going to hate me, but hey, this is life. Um, the case study is a group assignment. Now, let me try to explain to you what we want you to do there and tell you a little bit about what we expect you to do, but I'll come back and talk about that in week four when we allocate you to groups. What we are trying to do in the case study is get you to look at a company and in looking at that company, we're going to ask you what accounting numbers are important for this company. Okay, so if it's, a, if it's Qantas, then, then the lease numbers might be important. The revenue numbers might be important. What are the key numbers that affect how this company's financial statements look? And once you know those key numbers, you can go and say, all right, which are the accounting rules that relate to these numbers? <coughs> and then we ask you, with those accounting rules, what choices, what flexibility does this company have? In other words, given that they have incentives to play around with the accounting numbers, how much flexibility, how much possibility is there for them to actually play with those numbers? And depending on which company you have, your answer might be there's very little flexibility or it might be there's a lot of flexibility. If you get a mining company, the answer is probably going to be a lot. Okay, but we'll see how that goes. So I'll talk about that more in about week four. What I will do in week four, I have a marking guide um, or rather a, a schedule to assess how, um, for me to assess how I give you marks and the other people in the other classes as well. So I'll release that marking table so you'll know what things I'll be looking at, so you'll know what's important. Um, the other thing that I want to say about the case study, when we do get onto it, there are some points. I think there are about eight things you need to do please do not just split the mum up amongst the group. Don't say you do parts one and two, you do parts three and four, you do parts four and five, five and six, whatever. Um, you can have a person leading a part of the assignment, but if you've understood what I've said already, one of the first things we get to do is we ask you to see which numbers are important, and then we ask you to say what are the accounting policies that relate to that, right? and then what flexibility has likely happened there. So, I mean, most people follow this, but I actually had an assignment about four or five semesters ago where the important numbers were answered and then the accounting standards and flexibility they looked at were answered, but the flexibility was about totally different standards than the ones that were important for this company. So it was obvious to me that 
Somebody had done one part of the assignment, somebody else had done another part without looking, talking to that person, and then they just glued it together. And it was a pretty bad assignment. Okay, so I don't mind you allocating leaders for different parts, but you've got to talk to each other. Everybody owns every part of the assignment. Okay. All right, but we'll talk about that more in about week four. Um, the textbooks, uh, textbook, um, don't look at this one on the right, the financial reporting handbook. Um, the reason it's up there, we make the undergrads buy it, um, the reason it's up there is because the accounting rules, the accounting standards that apply are in that book. If you have lots of money and you feel like buying it, buy it. However, all of that stuff is available online. And there are no open book exams here, so we're not going to let you, at least in this subject. So buying it won't help. Um, but I will tell you where you can go to have a look at those. And I suggest you at least have a look at some of the accounting standards. Um, we will tell you everything you need to know about those standards in class, but it's probably useful to get a feeling for how they're written, how messy some of them are. So let's talk about the book on the left. <coughs> Thankfully, this is the only time I have to carry it. Um, the reason the book's important is almost all of the readings are from the book and almost all of the questions that we're asking, the tutorial or study questions are from this book. Um, if they're not from the book, then we've actually included them in the course outline, written them out in full. This is actually the same book. So if you've got this one, it's the same as this. The only thing that's different, um, about a year ago we talked to the publisher and we said, look, could you do us a version of the book that is cheaper because it only includes the topics that we want and is smaller? Um, the cheaper story got through. So this, I think this is about 150, this is about 100. Um, it's not smaller though, is it? Um, and it turns out that if you look at the paper, and that really disappointed me, the paper in the original book is nice and thin, the paper in this is a little bit thicker. So we thought we'd actually give you less weight to carry. Sorry. But at least it's cheaper. Right. Now, if you're desperate um, finance-wise, um, certainly we've been using these books for... I think this is now the second year, so there should be a reasonable amount on the second-hand market. I was driving to work the other day. There's a company um, up the road, but they're online, Zucal. They rent out textbooks. So if you want to rent a book, um, you can. It, it's sort of weird. I looked at their website. They sell second-hand versions for 70, but they rent for 50. Not a big discount. But then again, bear in mind that they're probably managing their risk that the book's not going to be used anymore. So, I mean, they exist, but I know, I'm the sort of person that would buy my own book, but it's up to you. So those options exist. Um, normally, oops, normally the um, co-op bookstore will have that text. That probably there are other bookstores because um, I know that Sydney Uni uses the books for some, book for some subjects. I think some of the people at New South also use it. So there should be reasonable amounts of those books out there on the market. Okay, so that's the text. By the way, um, if you've downloaded the slides, I originally, I had the right picture, but I had it written as 6th edition. It's actually 7th edition. Okay, I'm just, sometimes I type things incorrectly. Okay, so let's look at the structure of classes and so forth. Actually, I've um, probably been sitting here for close to an hour, so let's take a 10 minute break. And then we'll have a look at that. Uh, structure of your learning. Now, this is not a slide that I've included in there because um, I didn't want to overwhelm you. And it's, got, it's a bit messy. But basically, um, what we expect you to be doing, at least there are two key things we expect you to be doing each week. One of those is doing the readings. So let's talk about uh, where those readings are from. Most of them, if you have a look in the course outline, most of them are references to chapters of Deegan Chapter 7. So that's almost everything except for one reading for this week. So relating to this week, we've got a chapter from Whitred, Zimmer, Taylor and Wells. Now I'm going to talk about some managerial incentives, but it's probably useful, in fact I think it's very useful for you to have a look at that. So most of the material that we make available will be um, on UTS Online under course documents, so that's here. And Whitred and Zimmer, Taylor and Wells, the reading is down there. So you can download it, have a read of it. I can't remember how many pages that is. Um, those chapters aren't, aren't particularly huge. Uh, but it's a good introduction to incentives. 
I have used that as a text. Um, I think when I was still at UNSW, but the problem was it wasn't very technical text. So it gives you a good introduction to the theory. So we're asking you to read one chapter of that. Um, so that's basically the readings. And as a general rule, what we're going to do is we're going to cover new material in the class in the second and third hours. Now, don't hold us strictly to that. The first hour will be devoted to working through tutorial exercises. I'll talk about that in a moment. That might take longer or it might take shorter. Um, so please don't assume that, that the new material starts exactly at 7. It may actually start earlier. So that is the second thing that um, we expect you to do. The tutorial or self-study problems, I'll tell you where you'll find those in a moment. We expect you to do those before you come to class. And what we will have in class is we'll have one or two exercises, with the exception of next week, for you to work on. So what we will do in that first hour is we'll deal with any problems that you're having with any of those exercises, um, and we will work through one or two problems in class. We will work through is my fancy way of saying you will work through, and I'll be here to help you out if you have problems. Um, now, in so far as the self-study problems are concerned, if you go just after the schedule in the course outline, there's a list of the classes, so skip over that. And then all the remaining pages, except for the last two on the case study, are the problems for each week. So what you've actually got, in many cases, there's going to be references to Deegan. So the question numbers will be from Deegan. Um, but in the material for next week, you know, we've got four additional questions, AQ 1, 2, 3, and 4, talking about some of the Wittred, Zimmer, Taylor, and Wells issues. Okay, and as you see from topic two, where we cover the tutorial material in week three, onwards we will actually have in-class problems. So they're listed there in that little table. Um, I've also put little boxes around them in the list, so you know which ones we're going to look at in class. Now, insofar as those problems are concerned, all of the solutions to those problems are already up on UTS Online. So if you go under Assignments, I've just put another link to the course outline there in case you can't find the problems. All of the solutions are up here um, under Assignments. So I put those up today. Um, that's a PDF file, all solutions until the end of semester. Okay, you guys decide how you learn. If you want to look at those answers before you look at the problems, that's up to you. I strongly recommend you don't do that, though. I strongly recommend that you try to work through the problems and then look at the answers because, I keep saying this, but it, it's very easy to look at a question and look at an answer and say, yeah, I could have got that. Yeah, awesome. I covered that topic. Um, the real test, of course, is looking at the question, not looking at the answer and working out if you can get it. Okay, so they're there for you to decide how you want to study. Um, we're not going to treat you like little kids and say, oh, we're going to release the answers each week. Um, so, common sense approach there. Um, in fact, the answers to the in-class questions are also there. So, the idea with the in-class ones, look, I am realistic. I know that some people won't do any work beforehand. Um, even those that do, you might have some problems with some of the material. That's what the in-class problems are there for. That we can do them in class, you can talk to each other, and if it really doesn't make a lot of sense, you know, talk to me and we'll talk through some of those. Okay, so the idea with those self-study tutorial problems is that you do get a good understanding of the technical material. And in technical weeks, we will usually have an in-class demo as part of a, quote, lecture, unquote, anyway. So you will see enough technical material there to get on top of that. Okay, so they are the so-called tutorials slash self-study. Um, I've included the word flip learning in there uh, for two reasons. <laughs> One, because I am actually going to get you to work on one or two problems in class each week. And two, because that is the current educational fad. So UTS expects us to be up and with it and uh, up with the latest educational blah, blah, blah. Sorry, I've been, I've been teaching for about a quarter of a century and I've seen fads come and go. Um, and I've been sent forward. I think in around the year 2000, UNSW decided all its courses were going to be on CD. So I, they paid me about $10,000 in consulting fees to help them put that up. By the time it was finished, the fad had finished. Oh. Then two or three years ago, there was MOOCs, um, massive online courses. 
which uh, turns out they don't actually work the way people think they work. So people up the hill seem to think that the latest fad is flipped learning. At least we're not wasting too much money on it. UNSW is actually wasting money. I think the faculty business has spent about five million to build about four rooms to enable flipped learning. And two years down the track, nobody will remember that fad. But even though it's a fad, there are some useful things there. Working on problems in class is useful. It motivates you to get that work done. So if you can do the other tutorial problems before you come to class, then hopefully in class you'll feel comfortable with the problem we'll be working through. So you know, even if we leave aside the, flat, the, the fad and the fancy name, working on problems in class is actually useful. Okay, so that's the two main things we're going to be doing. Now the resources that we have um, to help you in your learning. Look, we understand that most people don't learn the same way. Different people have different approaches. Um, look, we are giving you the readings to do before you come to class. Don't expect to do the readings and understand everything. Um, that's not how it always works. The reason we use the Deegan textbook, we use it for two reasons. It actually reads reasonably well. That's one. And two, we know where all the mistakes are. Actually, by edition seven, most of the mistakes have gone. So it's a reasonable text to read. Um, but I remember trying to read textbooks when I was at uni and <coughs> it was pretty boring. Right, so if it's putting you asleep, skim through it, get a rough understanding of what the issues are, and then that will be fleshed out in class. And the good thing about working on the tutorial problems after the class is that if you are working on a problem and you have a question, it's much more sensible to do some reading when you're looking at an answer to a, looking for an answer to a question than just sort of reading vaguely and hope something soaks up. Okay, so the readings are there. Don't stress out if you don't understand everything or you can't get through it all before the class, but please try. Okay, but the tutorial problems there to bed some of that in, and the second and third hours of each class, the so-called lecture, is there to help bed that in as well. Okay, so that's the readings. Staff consultation hours, as I've already pointed out, my consults are five to seven on Tuesdays, but if that doesn't suit you, send me an email um, and we can organise to meet another time. I tend to be on, I'm not the sort of person who works at home, so I tend to be here for most of my life. It's particularly boring. Um, so feel free to have a chat with me or some of the other staff. Um, if, if those times don't work, just email me. We'll organise another time. Bear in mind, I won't be taking this class next week. <coughs> Helen will be here next week only, and my consultations will be cancelled for next week only because I'm flying to a conference. And I hate flying to conferences. Because they're all in Northern Hemisphere conferences are scheduled in the middle of semester. So I fly out on Saturday and I fly back the next weekend. Well, that's fun. We're going to Atlanta. Atlanta's about ex as exciting as Dundee, which is where I went to a few years ago. If you ever want to visit Dundee or some other place, choose option B. <laughs> Dundee is not exciting. Um, Okay, so staff consultation hours. Now, drop-in sessions, we haven't said a lot about those. Um, in the schedule, they are listed for Tuesday afternoons. I will be running all of those except the ones for next week. Um, now, I meant to bring the schedule. Um, it is in this building, but I... Actually, I think I can find out where it is. My apologies... Sorry, I should have checked this beforehand. 2004, semester two, class times. Um, the drop-ins are in B328, so basically two levels below here. Uh, but the rooms aren't exactly in the same spots. So Tuesday, right after my consultations. My consultations are three to five. I hope that's what I said. Um, and the drop-ins are five to, five to six and six to seven. Now, the way that the drop-ins work, the drop-ins are basically intended to be classes. Well, not, they're not classes. I, I don't want to use that word. I basically sit in a room, and you come along, and, and if you have questions, we talk about them. If more people have those same questions, we will deal with whatever questions people have. Now, that's how it's going to work next week. Next week, it will be Helen. The week after that, for some of the weeks, we will have specific things if people want to cover them. So, let me just see where I've got that. Um, sorry, these are actually not in the right order. Most, most of the drop-ins are going to be free form. 
So that means I have nothing prepared. And if that means I sit in the room by myself for two hours, that's fine. Bear in mind that that sometimes happens. So don't assume there'll be lots of people and you won't be able to chat. Most of the time there's only a few people coming along. So uh, if you need to talk to me about a problem or something, come along to that. And it's good because I'm sitting in front of a whiteboard, I can play around, work through exercises, what have you. Um, so that will be next week. In the week after I will be back, I'll be spending most of the drop-in talking about debits and credits and net present value calculations, if you feel uncomfortable with those concepts. The week after, we'll talk about reading accounting standards. That will probably take about 10 minutes at the beginning of the drop-in. The rest of the time will be free form as well. Um, and the week after that, we'll talk about answering theory questions. Uh, people who are interested in that, I'll probably give you an exercise for about 20 minutes, half an hour. Um, and then we'll talk about that. And then uh, the rest of that class will be three form. All the remaining drop-ins for the remainder of semester are free form. So if you can't see me during consultation hours um, or it's something that you want a larger group, three or four people, I'm happy to see during consults. More than four, it gets crazy. Um, so if you want to come along during the drop-ins, sort of like a consultation except it's in the room. And I can do stuff up on the screen, which makes it easy for everybody. Okay, so that's what the drop-ins are. Now, YouTube videos and screencasts. Let me go to the website. So if you look at course documents for FRA, yes, five o'clock to six and six to seven on Tuesday. On Tuesday. Oh, okay, okay, except for the room. So it's B three two eight. Now lecture slides. All of the lecture slides for this subject have been put up. What I've done is I've set them to automatically release. So all you can see are this week's. Um, if I turn off edit, you know, I turn on edit mode. Um, all of the ones for the whole semester are there. What I've done is I've set them up to automatically release on the Friday before the week to which they relate. So every week some more slides will, will become available. Um, one thing that I do need to draw your attention to, this subject has as part of its learning objectives to deal with the issue of sustainability. Um, rather than trying to shoehorn it into another of the subjects, a number of the weeks where it doesn't fit too well. What I've done is I've recorded a 15 minute mini lecture on sustainability. Okay, so it's a bunch of slides with me talking for about 15 minutes. It's pretty direct. Um, it gets you understanding the concept. It also gives you a few opinions about the concept. And there will be an exam question on sustainability at the end of the semester. So, and it's going to be, sorry, edit this out. It's going to be a relatively easy exam question, I hope if you've gone through those slides. Okay, so the sustainability material will become available um, after the mid-semester. It's just a 15-minute video you can just watch. Okay, so there are the lecture slides. Um, now, as I said, YouTube videos and screencasts. So the videos first. Most of these videos, there's another link to a sustainability lecture. Most of these videos have been done by my colleague David Bond. Um, I've taught with David on this subject and on the relevant undergrad unit, um, and we cover some fairly similar topics. So some of the technical issues have been addressed by videos that Dave did last semester. Um, I was on leave last semester, so I was gallivanting around the planet. Um, so things like profitability incentives for leases, accounting for income tax, foreign currency, long service leave, uh, calculating net present values, those are issues that Dave talks you through basically with little <coughs> videos. Generally, if you have a look here at the time, the times, usually those videos are no more than about eight minutes. So easy to just quickly digest. Now, lately we've tended to, and I'll probably record some videos as I go if I think of some more issues. Um, YouTube videos are much easier to record. A few years ago, Dave also did some screencasts. These are also types of videos, but they're, they're essentially PDFs. So they're a video, essentially a slideshow. The advantage of those, well, let's, let's have a look at one. Um, let's have a look at revaluations, for example. Um, if we look at them, they've got little timestamps at the side. So rather than just pulling across and jumping to where you want to go, you can jump to the little part of the topic that you're interested in. Let's hope that it actually displays. I'm hoping here. No? Okay, no. Great. 
Okay, on a normal PC, they might actually display. Sorry, I don't know what's happened. Maybe I don't have Flash installed. So if you've got a Mac, you might have problems viewing them. Um, but I think if you've got a PDF viewer, you should be able to view them. If you have problems viewing them, let me know. Okay, so they address some of the technical topics that we cover in the subject as well. They were recorded about two years ago for another subject. So ignore the fact that it says spring 2012 at the beginning. When they stop being relevant, we will remove them. And at the moment, they're all still relevant. The only one that's likely to become irrelevant in the next year or two is leases, because those standards are likely to change soon. Okay, so YouTube videos and screencasts are available up there on UTS Online. Um, the discussion board. As I said before, feel free to email me about personal issues you've got about where you are in the subject, enrolments, or personal difficulties you're having. If you've got questions about particular topics, go to the discussion board. That's here on UTS Online. You can see that there are four of the different topics, so topic one, topic two, topics three to five, six to seven. Ask the question in the relevant topic area. Sometimes another student might answer it. If not, usually I'll look at it every day or two and I'll answer it. Okay, so that's a good place to get questions answered. The self-study solutions I've already talked about, the lecture slides and demos, I've already told you that they're available under course documents, lecture slides. As you see, this week there's only lecture slides, uh, but I think next week we have lecture slides and a practical demo as well. So that basically means we'll work through that practical demo in class. So that will appear on Friday. Recordings of class, well, as you can tell, I am hopefully recording this. The announcements, generally announcements that I put up go on UTS Online, they're under announcements. If they're anything important, generally what happens when I put up an announcement, when I edit it, I have an option at the bottom once I type it in to say send a copy of this announcement. So generally if I put in something important I will click that and you'll get that into your UTS email. So most announcements I would do that for. I put one up earlier today about the changing building numbers at UTS. So I didn't think that was that important, so I didn't actually send that out to you. What this basically means, two things. Check the announcements regularly. If you go onto UTS Online, they show up anyway. And secondly, check your UTS email regularly. If you hate the UTS email and you think it sucks, then redirect it to one of your favorite emails, your Gmail or your Hotmail or whatever you like. Um, but check it regularly. When you email us, please email us from your UTS email. Or if you know how to set up Gmail or Hotmail to, to spoof the header, uh, you can set it up to make it look as if it's coming from your UTS one, if you know how to do that. Um, otherwise, just send it from your UTS one. The reason is that we set up filters, we get lots of emails, a lot of information overload. So if I know it's coming from a student, at least I'll see it. If you put 22748 in the subject, I'm even more guaranteed to see it. So I've got a filter set up for that. Okay, so that's about emailing us and announcements. That's probably it. Um, so I've talked about all of those. Yep. Uh, other useful resources. You remember that I mentioned earlier when I showed you the text, I showed you the one, um, the book that has the financial, the accounting standards, the financial reporting handbook, that thing. Um, and the reason you don't need to buy that is if you want to access the accounting standards, go to aasb.gov.au. Um, there's a really strange thing about that website. If you type in aasb.gov.au by itself without the www, it won't actually go there. Uh, government, bureaucracy, crazy. So don't forget to type the www in front of it. Okay, normally you shouldn't care. Um, and down here, there's table of standards. That has all the accounting rules that currently apply. Okay, you'll notice that for some of them, there's FP and NFP. Essentially, they're the same standards. FP stands for for-profit, so businesses. NFP stand for not-for-profit. Um, up until about a year ago, we didn't have that distinction. They are the same standards. All that there is is the NFP ones have a, a few additional explanatory paragraphs. Actually, since I'm talking about standards, I should actually clarify where we get our standards from in Australia. In Australia, we take a different approach to standard setting than almost every other country. We use the international standards, so the international financial reporting standards, but unlike some other countries, they are the only standards we use. 
So if you do accounting in Britain or the United Kingdom, sorry, Britain or France, sorry, I'm tired, coffee, coffee, coffee. Ah, when I start making errors, it's time to drink coffee. Um, if you do accounting in France or the UK, what you'll find is the accounting for large listed companies generally uses the international standards. Small local companies that aren't listed tend to use local standards. We don't take that approach in Australia. So in approach, in Australia, the international standards apply to everyone. There are a few exceptions. If you're a small entity, you get to apply the reduced disclosure regime where you don't have to apply all of the standards. But the ones that you do apply are the same. This has a number of implications. Um, part one of these implications arises from the crazy way international standard setters perform. Okay, so international accounting standards are called international financial reporting standards. And they go from one onwards. The AASB equivalent is exactly the same number. Right? Potentially they could go up to 99 at this stage. Now, before they renamed the standards to international financial reporting standards, they were called international accounting standards. About five or six years ago, they renamed the standard setter, but they left the old standards called as IASs instead of renumbering them to IFRSs. So there are still some IAS standards out there, and they still apply. Right? So the IAS ones are the old ones that still apply. So in Australia, they're renumbered into the 101 series. All right, so basically, 1 to 100 are direct copies of the new ones. 101 to potentially 999 or 1000. But there's not that many. There's less than 20 of those, I think, are copies of the old ones. Now, the other thing that you need to remember, the international standards are set by the International Accounting Standards Board. The International Accounting Standards Board is only concerned about business. Right? So they don't have to ask questions about how, are, how is this information used. They know that this is business information. They know that investors use this information. That's a no-brainer. But it also means they're only going to set standards that apply to business situations. So there are standards that we need in Australia, because we apply the same standards to everybody, that the international guys haven't set. For example, there's a standard for local governments. Um, I can't remember the number. Um, for land under roads. So if you're a government and you've got a road, under that road there's some land. Oh, they used to have a list in the front. Doesn't matter. Um, so what we've done in Australia is we have set any standards above 1001 are Australia-only standards because there is no international standard in that topic. So if you follow the Australian standards, you are guaranteed to follow the international ones. Okay. It just means you might be following more than the international ones. Okay, if the, oh, and there's one other standard. I think it's AAS 25, which is an old, old Australian standard on reporting by superannuation funds. Now, if that gets rewritten by the international guys, it'll go into the below 1,000 series. If it gets written by our, rewritten by our guys, it'll go into the 1,001 plus series. So eventually, we expect all the standards to be in the AASB 1 to 100 region as the international guys rewrite theirs. And, well, I know we're still going to have our local ones. So what does our standard setter do? It seems like it's a bunch of guys standing around a photocopying machine, right? Cross out the word international, write Australian. Um, actually, the International Accounting Standards Board has some resources, but somewhat limited nonetheless. So what actually happens, the AASB and standard setters from other countries, Singapore, France, the UK, Japan, they actually participate in standard setting in the international level. So when the International Accounting Standards Board decides it needs a new standard in an area, it'll delegate that out to a bunch of countries. Australia, Singapore, France might work together on a standard, for example. So is our AASB useful? Yes, it actually does some of the work for the International Board. And of course, the Australian standard setter set standards for um, entities in Australia for which there is no international standard. So are they useful? Yes. Well, they do do some work. Okay, so that's where you get the standards from. Um, CPO Australia has some fact sheets on accounting standards. And there are a bunch of databases at the library that might be useful for you when you get to your case study. So we'll talk about that when we get to week four. Um, that give you a whole bunch of background on, on companies. 
right? generally on listed companies, but yeah, generally listed companies. So when you get on to working on your case study and we allocate you a company to work on, that's a good place to start to find out about the company. Okay, so that's resources. So let's get on to um, the basics and talk about those two other aspects of the big picture. So I've said a little bit about incentives. Um, I've talked about regulation and we'll get into regulation, um, particular accounting rules starting from next week. Well, let's focus on incentives and talk about regulation. What is accounting trying to achieve? Or what is financial reporting regulation trying to achieve? Well, what's the purpose of accounting? Accounting is simply record keeping to record economic events. So economic events occur, we need to report them. Now, we are talking in this subject about financial reporting. Don't assume that financial means money. Financial has a specific meaning in accounting. When we talk about financial accounting or financial reporting, we mean reporting externally. Uh, generally, what we mean is reporting to providers of finance. So most of the time, lenders and shareholders. But also other external parties, such as customers and suppliers, might also be interested. So I'll, I'll talk about that in a few moments. Um, we contrast that with management accounting, or managerial accounting, which is addressing internal decision making. And that's not something that we talk about in this subject. Although, of course, there is some overlap. And many of the, you know, when you design an accounting system, you're trying to meet both of those needs, the external reporting needs and the internal reporting needs. But information internally, of course, will be at a greater level of, de level of detail and probably constructed a little bit differently. So if we're talking about financial reporting, why do accounting rules matter and wh why does financial reporting matter in general? It matters because the people who own resources are usually not the people who manage those resources. I mean, in modern capitalist society, we delegate responsibility for managing our resources. Okay, so I've got shares in the Commonwealth Bank. Um, I called them up a few weeks ago saying, can you please give me a lower interest rate? Um, I usually threaten my bank every three years or so. Um, you have to threaten your bank, otherwise they rip you off. So, you know, I, I call them up and I say, okay, as a shareholder, I'm really happy that you're ripping off your customers, but today I'm calling as a customer and I'd like you to give me a better interest rate. Um, and this is the problem. I'm an outsider. I don't, you know, as a shareholder, I rely on the financial reports that they send me. I can't actually look into their internal records. You know, if I go down, downtown to the Commonwealth Bank's headquarters and I say, please show me your accounts receivable, they'll show me this and they'll leave me out the door with security. Okay, so why are we keeping records? Well, because there's that split between managing resources and owning those resources. And that, that isn't just talking about shareholding, it's also talking about lending. Okay, you lend money to a company, really the only way you can monitor what that company is doing is through its external reports. Now, I fudged it a little bit there. There is a little bit of a difference between lending and buying shares. If you're buying shares, you have no choice. You rely on the external financial reports. If you're a lender, you're a bank, you can say, well, before I lend money to you, I want you to commit to give me certain financial reports. So you report the way I want or I won't lend you any money. Lenders have a little bit more power. Having said that though, the sort of information that lenders require usually overlaps a lot with the, lender, with the information that shareholders require. Now, can me give you an example. Um, one of the things that is particularly hard to measure, well, there are two things that are hard to measure. It is hard to measure intangible assets Things like goodwill or brand names, those sort of things. Now, that's okay. The current financial reporting standards say you can't really record them unless you've bought them. If you've created them, there's no way you can measure them reliably. But even if you've bought them five years ago, who's to say what the value is now? Any number associated with that sort of asset is bound to be unreliable. Right. Another type of unreliable number might be where you do a revaluation of an asset. So I might have a building that I bought in 1968 for you know, $10,000 and I've either got that building recorded in my books at $10,000, that's a reliable number but not very useful, not very relevant, or I have the option of revaluing that to bring in the market value. So I could say it's worth $100 million and I can record that. The problem is recording that is giving a slightly more relevant but a slightly less reliable number. It is really difficult to confirm that number. 
what, you look at how much identical buildings are selling for? Well, you can't. There is no identical building. Location matters. So it's really hard to look at what the market price really is until it's actually sold. So what a lender might do, a lender might say, look, there are some numbers that are too unreliable. So when you report to us, give us your external financial statements, but don't include any intangibles. And if you've revalued any buildings, undo the revaluations. So what a lender might say is, I want your usual reports, but make a few changes for me. So there will be a lot in common with what the shareholders get, but the lenders can ask for certain numbers that they view as unreliable to be removed. Okay, lenders have that power. Okay. Alternatively, they just say, we won't lend you the money. Okay, so there's some discussion about what is the world's oldest profession. I would warrant to say that it's accounting. Um, these are some records, and I think we've established that they're accounting records relating to beer production in Iraq. Uh, the irony of that never ceases to amaze me. Um, about 5,100 years ago. Okay, basic inventory records, barley and other stuff. Um, in fact, if you read about any history of accounting, it's not just record keeping that accounting's been dealing with. Again, go back to Mesopotamia um, to closer to 3,000 years ago. Um, accounting also fulfills an internal control function. So what, one thing they would do is if they were sending some inventory to another city, how do you know that the inventory you actually, or how does the person at the other end know that the inventory you actually sent was the inventory that they received? What they used to do was they used to bake a clay tablet that had the markings across both parts of the tablet. The tablet was broken in half. One part was taken to the person in a distant city. Once a ta clay tablet is baked, you can't change it, right? You can't sort of get liquid paper and sort of take some of the rock out. So, you know, accounting isn't just about information, it's also about control. And it's been used that way for a long time. Okay, so accounting, as far as we're concerned, we're not going to focus so much on control here. The auditors will talk about that in their subject. Accounting is trying to achieve useful information for decision making. Okay, so when we talk about decision making, so far I've talked about investment and lending. I don't like that distinction. If you say, hang on, how is lending different from investment? Lending is a type of investment. I guess what we're trying to say there is investment as equity holders, so as shareholders, that's one type of investment, right? So that's equity investment. And investment as debt holders or lenders, that's another type of investment. So the words you might, you could take um, issue with, but the concepts I think are reasonably straightforward. So why do we have this problem? Well, I've already talked about it. Society has got more complex. Um, to run a complex business, you need a lot more resources than you did 500 years ago. Okay, three or 400 years ago, we already had companies starting to be structured as ways of um, undertaking certain types of enterprises. You know, trading with Indonesia, for example, um, trading with other parts of the world was generally done by companies incorporated in European countries. Okay, so life is complex. We need to get a lot of people together to undertake economic activity. And what that basically means is we will be delegating management responsibility to someone else. So what's your problem when you delegate management responsibility? How do you know the manager is doing what you want them to do? Right? Generally, the only way you can actually monitor that is through the financial reports. Let, let me be a bit more careful about that. The only way you can sensibly monitor that is through financial reports. Potentially, if you have a CEO, you could give that CEO a security guard with a dog that follows the CEO around with orders to bite the CEO if he ever takes the wrong decision. Now, there are so many problems with that, it's not even funny, right? One problem is, can you get a security guard with a sufficiently high IQ? Sorry, cheap shot, cheap shot, cheap shot, cheap shot. Um, secondly, for actually running a business, it's not going to look pretty good if, you know, you go to a meeting with um, important foreign clients and there's a security guard with a dog ready to bite you. But thirdly, if you could predict every decision the manager was going to take and you knew what the right answer was and what the wrong answer was, you wouldn't need a manager, right? You just write a computer program, feed in the question, out pops the answer. You hire managers because you rely on their judgment. That means they make the decision that they think is appropriate and it's really hard to check whether that decision itself is appropriate. You might be able to look at the effects and if he's making a lot of bad decisions, there are a lot of bad effects, you probably know he's a bad manager. But it's really hard 
to de decide whether a decision is good or bad at the time it's being made. I mean, if Steve Jobs was um, uh, monitored that way, maybe a lot of the technology we're using might never have happened. Okay? Being a manager sometimes involves taking risks that are out there that nobody else agrees with. So because judgment is involved, you know, it's, really hard, it's really hard to control managers. So we have to control them indirectly. Okay, now what do we want from financial reporting? From financial reporting, we want information that is going to satisfy our information needs. The reference, by the way, you don't need references to these statements. I'm putting them up there for completeness, but you don't need to remember what SAC2 is. Basically, there are a bunch of statements that tell us what accounting is about. There's one that's international called the Framework for Financial Report, sorry, Framework for Reporting, and that tells us things like accounting information needs to be reliable, it needs to be relevant, it needs to be understandable, things that we can all agree with. In Australia, though, we have two statements of accounting concepts, one and two, that tell us what accounting is trying to achieve. The reason we need that in Australia, remember, the international standard setters are just setting rules for business. So what are we trying to achieve with financial reporting? If we're talking about business, it's obvious, making investment decisions. But in Australia, we're applying those standards to all entities. So we need to ask the question, when are these reports required? Who needs those reports? Okay, what's the purpose of general purpose financial reporting? Well, generally, it's about making decisions. Duh. Um, are you going to re-elect a manager? Are you going to have them assassinated? Um, are you going to buy more shares? Are you going to lend to a company? Are you going to sell your shares? And what information do you need for that? Well, information that's relevant for those decision-making purposes. So generally, that's going to be stuff like your balance sheet, statement of financial position. What is the position of this company? If you're making a decision, you have to know what resources and what claims on resources exist. Right? If I... Okay, I'll get back to that in a few minutes. Um, statement of financial performance. So what we might call the income statement or what is now called the statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income. Sorry, every, see, every time I turn around, the income statement's got a new name. I think it's about the fourth name it's had in 10 years. So I'm just going to call it the income statement, the thing that measures profit. Um, and the cash flow statement, where we get information about financing, investing, and operating cash flows. So we've decided that those are the bits of information that people need to make decisions, Who's going to be making decisions? Well, most of the time we focus on equity investors and debt investors, so shareholders and lenders. But um, we may also be providing information that is used by other stakeholders, like customers or suppliers. We have this concept in, Australia, in the Australian rules called the reporting entity. Even if you're a private company, if you issue securities onto the market, there are enough people interested in your activity that you have to provide financial reports. The only people really exempted from financial reporting, from following the accounting rules, are really small companies. Right? And the definition of really small we'll talk about later. Um, I've got a company for which I do consulting. That company has one shareholder, uh, one manager. <laughs> okay. Um, so my company affects almost nobody. I haven't made any income through that for about three years. So to be honest, it's a tax dodge. Oh, sorry, censor. Um, so it's basically for me to hold some of my assets. So nobody really cares about my company. It doesn't have enough economic activity to affect anybody else. I'm not a reporting entity. That means I don't have to follow the rules, the, the accounting rules. In fact, all I have to do is re-register my company every year, but because it's so small, I only have to fill out three bits of paper, and they're really easy, and pay about $200, I think. Nobody needs my financial reports. The only person who cares about my financial... Sorry. The only people who care about my financial position are the tax office. But they don't use normal financial reports anyway. To them, you give them a tax return that follows slightly different accounting rules. Okay. And, and by the way, that just reminds me of a point. If we ever ask you why a company makes a choice that increases or decreases profit, don't be tempted to say you're doing it to avoid tax. Okay? Because what you do for financial reporting is not necessarily the same as what you do for tax. The rules are slightly different. There are situations where you make estimates for accounting where you're not allowed to make those estimates for tax. So you have to report your tax differently. So just because you reduce your profit for accounting doesn't mean your tax profit has decreased. Okay? Those things are linked but loosely. Okay, so you know, does government rely on financial reporting? Certainly not for tax collection, but for broad policy, 
industry policy, it might want to look at your financial statements. Customers and suppliers, do they care? Well, there was a company in, I don't think we make any cars in Australia anymore, do we? Are they all closed now? Uh, almost all. Mitsubishi doesn't make cars here anymore, does it? Mitsubishi used to make cars. I mean, I don't really care, but they used to make cars. Mitsubishi, I mean, I, I'm sorry. Um, in Australia? Probably not, yes. Yeah, so they're importing them from overseas. Okay, Mitsubishi used to make cars near Adelaide, and there was a company there that made car seats just for Mitsubishi. Right, so you're a supplier to Mitsubishi, and you've got one customer. I think it's pretty clear that they would have cared a lot about Mitsubishi's financial performance in Australia because you're at high risk, right? If Mitsubishi aren't doing well, then you should probably get into another business. Um, similarly, you might be interested in the financial performance of your suppliers. What if you buy really specific technology? Um, so one of my former students from a few years ago used to work for a dredging company. You know, mining ships come in um, to various ports around the country. Some of those ports aren't deep enough. You need to dredge out the crap out of the bottom so the ships can come in. There's very specific machinery to dredge them out. Now, if you're buying that machinery from a supplier and there aren't many suppliers of that machinery on the planet, then you want to make sure if there's a problem, there is going to be um, a maintenance. You know, you'd be able to buy parts. You'd be able to get maintenance for it. So if you're a customer, you will care a lot about whether your supplier continues to exist. Okay, so there are circumstances in which you really care about the financial performance of your customers and your suppliers. But I think it's pretty clear that for most companies, the people who care the most are shareholders and lenders. These are people who put real money on the table and they're expecting some sort of return. And it's important to understand these guys have different interests. Right? If you're a shareholder, you care about two things. Well, we both care about both of them, but you have a different attitude. If you're a shareholder... You don't necessarily want low risk. If risk is higher, you want it to be matched with higher return. So shareholders are looking for those two things to be matched. Lenders are a little bit different. right? Lenders assess risk when they lend you the money, but once they've lent it to you and they've set an interest rate, they don't want you taking on more risk later. So once you've lent money to somebody, you want to make sure that they do not become more risky. So lenders are actually very concerned about risk. And in fact, they will write contracts that force you to do certain things if you become more risky. So a lender might write a contract that says, if your debt to asset ratio goes above 30%, you need to immediately repay your debt, for example. That might be a condition they might put in. Now, what do they really do? Yes, they might want the money back, but what they're really saying is, if your debt to asset ratio gets too high, so if your balance sheet looks too risky, they'll say, you've got to repay, You'll go to them and you'll say, please, please, don't make me repay. Ah. And then they'll go, let's talk. And of course, to compensate for that increased risk, they will want a higher rate of return. So they might negotiate the debt. So really, lenders are concerned about making sure that what they get out compensates them for the risk that they take. Because if profit goes up, lenders still just get interest. If profit goes down, and equity gets wiped out, lenders might lose something. So lenders don't participate in the upside. Risk is about bigger upside, bigger downside, right? But lenders don't participate in the upside, but the downside can cause problems for them. So lenders prefer less risk. Shareholders, though, they don't mind more risk so long as it's matched by more returns as part of a diversified portfolio. If you've only got one share, then you probably don't want risk. Most shareholders don't invest like that. Okay, so what sort of decisions are these guys making? Look, if you look at that slide... Basically, there's really only one thing there. How much do I invest? Do I put more money in? Do I take some money out? So do I sell my shares? Do I buy new shares? Do I lend? Do I ask for repayment? And if you're a lender, the other thing is, what conditions do I care about? So what do I do to make sure that my risk is being managed when I lend you some money? Okay, so they're the sort of decisions that are being made. Now, how is accounting information fitting into that? Well... Shareholders care about profit. How profitable are you? Ultimately, they want to motivate managers to create more profit. Now, here's where we have a problem with, it, with accounting. The financially reported profit is the result of two things. It's the result of real stuff, i.e. actually the business activities that you do, 
and it's the result of the accounting interpretation of that real stuff. So financial reports are reality plus accounting. Now, if you motivate managers to increase profit, they have two options for increasing profit. Actually, they have three. One is do real stuff. Okay. Two, do accounting stuff. So, you know, maybe change your depreciation calculation. That's one we feel comfortable with at the moment. A few other things they could do. Or three, do fraud. Hopefully, they're not going to do fraud because in the end, everybody suffers. But sometimes, um, people do suffer because of fraud. Um, example, there was a guy called um, Chainsaw Al Dunlap. And the reason he had the nickname Chainsaw was he was really good at cutting costs. Really good. Um, and he got hired by Sunbeam. Go to Wikipedia, look, put, in Dunlap, put in Chainsaw Al, put in Sunbeam, and you can read the whole story. But basically, he put a lot of pressure on his managers in Sunbeam to cut costs. So, it, and the pressure was real. It was something like, if you were the bottom 20% of managers, or maybe it was bottom third, in any given year, you would lose your job. Right? So the pressure was really strong to increase profits. Okay, so how can you increase profits? Well, firstly, you can do real stuff. So do everything you possibly can do to cut sales, and then um, s to cut costs, and then sell more. Okay, so he's put pressure on you to increase profit in the first year. You do all the real stuff you can. Great, profit's up. Pressure's still on the second year. Okay, pressure's on in the second year. You've already done everything to try to sell as much as you can. What's the next thing you can do? Well, you can do some accounting. You can do some accounting fudges. But, and look, I mean, what, when we make an accounting adjustment, every time we make an accounting adjustment, for example, you record, um, let's say, electricity expense at the end of the year. You've used electricity, you haven't paid for it yet, but you need to record electricity expense to correctly measure how much was used. Every time you do one of those adjustments, you're affecting two things. A an expense, in the case of electricity, and a liability, the amount that you owe to the electricity company. So every time you do an adjustment, you're affecting the income statement and the balance sheet. But that means if you adjust electricity this year, the next year, when you pay that electricity, it won't be an expense of next year, it'll be paying off the liability you created at the beginning of this year. So if that's the way it works for expenses and liabilities, it works the same way with revenues and assets. So let's say you do some accounting stuff. Let's say that at the end of this year, you increase revenue and you increase an asset, say a receivable. The next year, when that money comes in, the first bit of money that comes in isn't a revenue of the new year, it's a receivable from last year. So the first money that comes in isn't revenue. So the first few days, no revenue. Only then, everything after that is revenue. Pressure's still on to increase profit. So at the end of this year, you've got to keep increasing profit, but you're stuffed because the amount you increased last year undid itself at the beginning of this year. So just to stay still, you've got to repeat what you did last year. And to make it grow, you've got to create more. Right? Now, you can't keep creating profit out of nowhere. So eventually... There might be changes in estimates. Maybe that happened for a year or two. And then eventually they started getting even more creative. When ac accounting becomes creative, it borders on fraud. And these guys had a lot of pressure. If they didn't do it, they would lose their jobs. So what did they do? Here's an example of what they did. Sunbeam sells white goods. So we mean home appliances. Fridges, washing machines, irons, that sort of stuff. That's what they did at the time. Now, I want to increase my sales. Who was Sunbeam's customer? Sunbeam's customers were retail shops, shops that sold these to you and me. So I would go up to my customers and I would say, I'd like to sell you next year's product early, and I'll give you a discount if you buy it, because I really need to make these sales. They would come back to me and say, well, hang on. Yeah, look, I'd like to help you, and the discount's nice, but I can't buy your new product because I've got your old product in the store, and if I've got the new product and the old product, people will buy the new product, not the old product. So it's not good for me to buy your new product. Ah, but I've got a deal for you. How about this? I'll sell you next year's product, and you don't have to pay me yet. So increase sales, increase accounts receivable. And not only do you not have to pay me yet, you'll say, it's going to cost me to store it. I'll store it for you. I'll sell it to you, but it'll stay in my warehouse. So increase cost of goods sold, decrease inventory, because it's not my inventory. It's in my warehouse but it belongs to you. Now, if you've done those journal entries, you've sold it to someone, but they haven't paid you yet, 
and they, ha and they haven't got the item yet, you have to ask, is that a real sale? How genuine is that? If you stretch that too far, if you stuff the sales channel too far, eventually it becomes fraud. And that's what happened. And Chainsaw Owl, as a result of all that, was banned from ever um, having, uh, being a director of a company for the rest of his life. Because basically he pushed it so hard that if you push people too far, once they've run out of real stuff they can do and accounting stuff they can do, eventually they'll turn to fraud. Okay? So you know, the motivations are great, but if you motivate people through profits, or in this case their jobs, um, eventually they might do accounting stuff instead of real stuff. And you know, even real stuff can be bad because if you're motivated to increase profit, what's one way of increasing profit? Doing less maintenance. But if you do less maintenance, okay, less expense this year, but maybe the machine, instead of lasting 10 years, it'll, it'll die after eight years if you don't keep to the maintenance schedule. Okay, so doing some real stuff is bad. At least in that case, you'd be happy they just did accounting stuff. At least they wouldn't be damaging the business. Okay, so you put too much pressure on people, uh, and you know, this pressure exists for managers to increase profit, then they might not exactly do what you want them to do. Okay, what other information? So we use that for contract, but we also use that for measuring performance um, in making investing decisions. Balance sheet. Well, for information purposes, what does that do? It tells us the status of the business. What are its assets? What are its liabilities? Therefore, what's its equity? What are the net assets? Why is that useful? Well, it gives you a feeling for how the business can adapt to new circumstances. If circumstances change, how many assets do they have? What assets do they have? If they have a lot of assets that are in liquid form, you know, cash or equities in other companies, they can quickly sell them and take on a new business opportunity. So looking at a balance sheet gives you a good feeling for the business's ability to move forward. It also gives you a, a feeling for their risk. Okay, so lenders, shareholders to some extent as well are also interested in the risk. Okay, so the debt to asset ratio, or if you want, because it maps one to one, some people talk about debt to equity ratio, both of those are leverage measures. Um, revenues and expenses. Um, look, there is a risk measure you can get from the income statement. And one of those, well, there's a few, but um, one of the risk measures is earnings before interest and tax divided by interest. Why is that a risk measure? Um, let's say that you make $100. Let's, let's assume simply that you have no tax. So you make $100 from your operations, you've got to pay $10 in interest. So what's your profit? 90. Take earnings before interest and tax, so the 100, divided by 10. That's your interest. Gives you an EBIT, a times interest earned ratio of 10. 100 divided by 10. That is a business that is relatively safe. Even if, it prof if its profit halves to 50, it can still cover its interest. However, if your profit is one, and your interest is 10, what must have your profit been before interest? 11. 11 divided by 10 is very close to 1. Profit gets a little bit smaller, and you can't make your interest payment. So in addition to the debt asset ratio, another way of assessing risk is looking at the times interest earned ratio. And that is quite frequently used in debt contracts. So if your times interest earned ratio is too low, then you're probably high risk. OK, so there are these measures of risk in both of those things. What about the cash flow statement? What does that tell us? Cash flow statement for information purposes gives us information about the structure of the business that we can't get from anywhere else. We'll take a five minute break in a minute. So um, how, would you how would you use that information? Well, let me give you an example. Let's say you've got a growing firm. If a firm is growing, you would expect it to have positive operating cash flows so that means cash flows to customers and less cash flows to suppliers. So from customers, less suppliers. You would expect it to have negative investing cash flows. If it's growing, it's buying more assets. It's growing. So you're spending money on assets. And if investors, lenders and shareholders have confidence in your growth, they are happy to give you more money, buy more shares or lend you more money. So financing cash flows would be positive. So if you see that pattern, plus minus plus, that is probably a growth firm. Um, what's a bad picture to see? A bad picture to see is, it doesn't matter what operating is, but if investing is positive and financing is negative, that, what's that saying? You're getting cash from investing. In other words, you're selling assets and you're paying off debt. 
That either means you're really stuffed and you need to get your debt down quite low, or you're temporarily rebalancing. You've stretched yourself too far, you need to bring it back a bit. So that's telling you there might be a problem there. Okay. Alternatively, you might look at something like Microsoft, um, which I think seven or eight years ago paid its first dividend. So Microsoft's got positive operating, negligible, in, well, negligible investing, and negative financing. So what's Microsoft? Microsoft is what we would call a cash cow, a company that is generating cash from its operations, has no, or doesn't have many new investment opportunities, so is returning a lot of those funds back to the owners, to with as they see fit. Okay? So that is an impression that helps you understand the business. It's an impression that you can only get from the cash flow statement. So that's why that's useful. Okay, so what we've talked about so far are information needs for decision making, but I've also mentioned some of the contracting needs that lenders might have. Uh, let's take a five minute break and then we'll go on to move on to incentives. We've talked about um, using accounting for, for decision making and I keep coming back to this um, incentive stuff because it's what's going to be driving most of the subject. So um, let's formally get into the incentive stuff. I mean, why, why, are incentives, why do incentives matter? Because basically all a company really is, in fact all, all any sort of firm really is, you like to think that it's a separate creation, but really it's just a nexus of contracts. It's a bunch of people who have different contracts with each other, and together they operate and they call themselves a company or another form of entity. But ultimately, there are contracts that determine relationships between these people. And we know that debt contracts include terms that use accounting numbers. And we know that management compensation contracts use terms that um, use accounting numbers. I mean, management compensation contracts want managers to perform. So there's going to be something there that measures performance and rewards them for performance and motivates them to perform. Well, we know that lenders are concerned in their contracts about risk. So they want to you know, keep risk under control because that essentially minimizes the probability that the value of their debt will go down. So contracts are there basically to judge the relationships between people. And the reason we need these, sorry, to control the relationships is because well, the world is too big to just simply trust. So the sort of contracts that we see between entities, you know, the ones that we'll be talking a lot about will be contracts between equity investors and the company, um, or actually, to be honest, between equity investors through the company with management, and contracts between lenders and the company. Now, when we talk about these contracts in this subject, and when you look at the Wittred, Zimmer, Taylor and Wells um, reading, there's an interesting aspect to that. They talk about two conflicts. There's the conflict between equity investors and management. Equity investors want more performance and they're happy to take more risk. So they write contracts that motivate managers. And in fact, if you, a manager in his or her natural state actually doesn't like risk. A manager cannot diversify his or her job. So managers naturally would not like a lot of risk. But shareholders write contracts to encourage managers to take on risk. Because shareholders, if they get more risk, they get more return. So when you think of a manager, you don't actually think of somebody who hates risk. Now, why do managers seem risk loving? Because the contracts that shareholders write, the companies write with managers, tend to attract risk loving individuals. Because that's what shareholders want. So shareholders are trying to motivate managers to take on risk to increase profit. But lenders, when they contract with the firm, they don't want risk. So they're contracting with the firm. There's already this conflict between managers and equity investors, and lenders come into the mix. There's the assumption when we talk about the lender, lender incentives that the other conflict doesn't exist at the same time. So it's a little bit of a simplification of the way that the world works. But anyway, these are the two main contracts that we're going to view. Okay, so we know that these contracts use accounting numbers. And we know that the reason this happens is because people act in their own self-interest. This is the assumption of agency theory, that managers will act in their self-interest. So what we're trying to do in rewarding managers is give them a contract where if they act in their self-interest, they will also act in ours. In other words, give them profit that rewards, sorry, give them a share of profit, for example. Now, that's not always what you want to do, though, right? Giving them, um, giving them an increase in profit 
sorry, giving them a share of profit may actually lead them to make the wrong decisions. For example, let's assume that you're a manager, you're planning to work for this company for two years. Shareholders are interested in the longer term. So shareholders want profit to grow over the long term. If you're a manager, you have a real short-term incentive. Make profit bigger these two years, you take your bonus home, and then somebody else cleans up the mess after you. How do shareholders deal with that? There are other ways of dealing with that. Don't give managers a straightforward bonus. Um, give them a bonus not in cash, but give it to them in shares. And restrict those shares. You make the contract so they can only sell 10% of those shares each year, for example. So in that case, yes, they'll get their bonus, but they've still got shares in the company. They can only sell a little bit each year. So they're not just going to worry about the next two years. They're going to worry about how the company performs over the next 10 years if they're still going to have shares in that company for 10 years. Right? So by giving them shares that are partly locked up, you will change their incentives to be a little bit more like yours. Alternatively, um, if, you know, other solutions are give them share options. Um, what's, if an option is priced appropriately, if a share price moves by 1%, you can make the option move by 10%, if it's priced appropriately. Okay, so that can actually encourage managers to take on a little bit more risk that hopefully leads to more profit down the track. Um, many option programs that have been implemented haven't necessarily been thought through, thought through very well. Um, if you're interested in how options packages can go wrong, put in Job's Apple options. Okay, Apple Computer had this thing when Steve... I think it was the early 2000s, where they gave their executive op executives options. Theoretically, when you give an executive an option, you should give them an option that's worth zero. So they have an incentive to get the share price up. Share price goes up by 1%, the option might go up proportionately more. Okay? So you shouldn't give them options that already have a value, because then you're giving them free money. But what you want to give them is motivation. What Apple actually did was they lied about the date when they gave the options. So they gave the options on this day, but they pretended they gave them on this day when the share price was lower. So when the share price was lower, the option was actually worth zero. But the actual day they gave the option, they already knew it had gone up, it had value. But they lied about the date. So if you measured it at the grant date, the official grant date, the option had zero value. But when it was actually granted, i.e. not in the paperwork, it already had value. And the SEC in the US ended up sort of sorting them out for that, had to pay fines. So, you know, it's, it's great to say, let's have an option scheme, but you need to think it through. You don't just say to managers, oh, you work out how it's going to work. It's like giving a small child, you know, the key to a cookie jar. They can take it whenever they want. They'll do whatever they want. Okay, so we've got this problem. People act in their own self-interest. We can't control them directly because we're not there, and we don't have all the information that they have. Right? We cannot observe everything the manager does, and in fact, if the manager announced everything he did, he would probably be giving away some secrets that would give the competition an advantage. So really, we have to focus on other measures, and usually those measures are things that are as simple as profit to assess whether this guy is going to be performing well. So that's the agency problem. We're trying to motivate him, but w he's our agent. We can't control everything he does. So he might do things that we don't want. He might take bad decisions, for example. Um, some examples, there's a com much more complete set in the Whitford, Zimmer, Taylor and Wells reading. I think there's about four for equity and four for lenders. So let me talk about what these are. Perquisite consumption. Um, I think the way this is classically described is something like this. To motivate managers, let's give them 1% ownership of the company. That means if they increase profit, they increase the value of the company, they will get 1% of that. That can be a lot in a big company. So managers will be motivated to increase value. But think about the cost to the manager if the manager uses company resources for his own benefit. Okay? If a manager decides to pay, assuming he could get away with it, the manager decides to pay his children's school fees with company money. The pays $100, how much is it going to cost him? $1, because he only owns 1% of the company. The remaining shareholders pay the remaining $99. .99. Okay, so the manager is not exposed to the full cost of his actions. 
That's why sometimes people say you shouldn't give them a share of profits, you should give them an option where his reward is a lot more sensitive to the value changes that he causes, he or she causes. Okay, so perk was that consumption is misusing resources of the company. Um, and it's really hard to control this directly. I mean, you can imagine that if you hire a CEO, that CEO needs a fantastic office, you know, to do negotiations in, impress customers, suppliers. Um, probably needs to be corner office with a beautiful view. Hmm. In the new building across the road, the dean is going to have the seventh, the top level, top level floor. He's talking about here how he needs to be in the middle of things. I asked at a meeting, why aren't you going to be on level four in amongst it all? Yeah. Oh, well, because the way all the other schools worked out, we couldn't fit them in, so unfortunately I have to go on the top level. Yeah. Mm. Unfortunately. It's amazing how UTS, Macquarie, New South, yeah, Sydney's weird. Um, all the deans are on the top levels of their building. Mm. With big areas to entertain. Anyway, um, so yes, manager needs a top level top level office, he needs a drinks cabinet of course, he needs an executive washroom, he needs a t solid gold toilet bowl. Okay, how much is too much? That's the question, it's really hard to define that in advance. Like should a manager have a really fancy car or a slightly average car? Should they have a corporate jet or should they fly first class? How much is too much? And it, it's, you cannot control that, you cannot write down in a contract every decision that the manager is going to make. Because the manager would spend more time checking whether his decisions are okay than actually doing business. That would be the problem. So perkles at consumption is something we can only, you know, we can control it indirectly. Okay, different time horizons. I've already mentioned that. The idea that, you know, most CEOs tend to stay for about five to eight years. So the CEO has a relatively short time horizon. Now imagine a CEO who's going to retire next year. Now at least if he's not going to retire, anything bad he does will reflect in the managerial job market. He'll have a bad reputation, he might have a problem getting a job later. Um, not if he's a good talker though. One of the former deans at UNSW um, spent $15 million doing all this international marketing and stuff that made no difference. But he was being, he was asked to do international engagement, so that was good. And in the last year he was dean, I hope he never listens to this, in the last year he was, I, I won't say who it is, in the last year he was dean, um, he went on a fundraising thing. So he raised 12 million for the faculty. Everybody thought he was great. He did all these things there and he raised some money. So he got rewarded for digging a $15 million hole and he got rewarded for filling in 12 million of it. Now that's spin, right? If you can get rewarded for doing the bad stuff and then fixing it, right? Now he was only a dean. Think about the things CEOs can get away with. Okay, so, uh, you know, the managerial labor market may matter because you affect your reputation. But if you're someone who's going to retire next year, you don't care about the market, you don't care about your reputation, the incentive issues are a little bit more serious. But giving the guy shares that he can sell slowly may address some of that. Okay, so there are issues, there's some of the issues we have um, with the relationship between shareholders and, and managers. And there are also issues relating to risk that I think I've already talked about. Now what about lenders, things that they're concerned about? Um, lenders are concerned about claim dilution. So you know that if you lend to a company, you can lend with different levels of security. I'm not a lawyer, so I won't get into the details, but you can have unsecured lending, you can have uh, lending secured of a floating charge, you can have mortgage secured lending. They're progressively safer. Now imagine that you lend to a company at an unsecured level, and you're the only lender. That's okay, you feel safe. Anything happens to the company, you're the only lender, you're the first person that gets paid. You get money before the shareholders get anything. But what if after they've borrowed from you, they then go and they borrow from somebody else at the same level? You're no longer first in line, you're equal first in line. So if the company goes bad, you have to share pay off of the other guy. What if the next loan isn't at your level, it's the next level? So that guy gets paid everything before you get anything. That's claim dilution. So the way you address claim dilution, a number of ways. Um, look at the debt asset ratio, make sure there's not too much debt in this company in the contract, that's one thing you can do. You can do what the Commonwealth Bank does with me. When I borrowed money for my house, it said, if you want to use this house as security for anything else, you, if you want to use it for another mortgage, you have to get permission from us. In fact, it was in my contract. I'm, I'm an accountant, I'm anal, I actually read my contract. right? And it actually said, you cannot use it as security for anything else. So that's another way you can prevent that happening. Okay, so that's a way of preventing claim dilution. What's asset substitution? 
look, asset substitution is, colloquially, it's bait and switch. So asset substitution is where I say to you, will you lend me a million dollars? You say to me, Robert, what do you want a million dollars for? And I'll say, I want to build a shoe factory. Ah, people have to wear shoes. Good, very safe, good investment. Okay, here, have a million dollars. And then after I get your million dollars, I take it and invest it in the Star City Investment Fund. <laughs> oh, sorry, it's now called The Star. Okay? Now, realistically, where does the problem lie? I'm promising you a certain risk profile. So I invest in real assets. But instead, I invest in something else. I invest in securities. Maybe other companies' shares, options, bonds, what have you. But how would you control that? Well, you would maybe write, and these do actually happen, in the contract you would say, after we lend to you, you cannot have more than 5% of your total assets in marketable securities, so in securities that trade. Now, why would you not say zero? Well, companies may legitimately need to invest, right? If you've got a machine that's being used up, you need to save up to replace it. So where are you going to keep that money? In a bank account? Yeah, stupid. Alternatively, put it somewhere where it's earning you some money until two or three years down the track, you, you can take it out directly by the asset. So we don't want to restrict people from, you know, to doing nothing. So what are we seeing here? We're seeing accounting numbers everywhere. We're seeing profit directly or indirectly in relation to controlling equity, the equity conflict. We're seeing the debt to asset ratio for controlling risk. We're seeing times interest earned, so EBIT divided by interest for controlling risk. So we want this to be low, we want this to be high. Um, maybe marketable securities ratio to total assets. We want this to be low. Okay, and there are other numbers that are used, even maybe the current ratio, current assets to current liabilities. Oh, but that's not used that much because you know short-term fluctuations and that don't necessarily mean that the underlying risk is bad. Okay, so accounting numbers are used to control a lot of these conflicts. Other conditions as well, but accounting does come into that. So what does that mean? If you know these numbers are being used, there are situations where you want to manipulate these numbers if you're a manager. Go back to the lease example I talked about earlier today. Right? If you can disguise something as a lease instead of a loan and an asset, then your debt liabilities don't go up, asset doesn't go up, so your debt to asset ratio stays where it is. Okay, uh, Whitford and Zimmer, Whitford, Zimmer, Taylor and Wells talk about those conflicts in a lot more detail. I think it's worth having a read of that. So what do we do? We engage in bonding mechanisms or contract monitoring mechanisms, so auditing, making sure that those um, contracts are enforced. Okay, so I've talked about these issues. Um, so now let's talk about I've done contracts. So now let's go back to the third function of accounting, which is stewardship. Now, we talk about these three functions of accounting. Accounting is there to help people make decisions. It's there because the numbers are used in contracts. And it's also there to fulfill a stewardship role. Now, stewardship is actually a simple concept. I give you money. You come back to me and tell me what you've done with that money. Now, for me, for a long time, I didn't understand the difference between stewardship and decision making. But why do I want to know what you've done with that money? Because I'm going to make a decision with it. So, you know, I want to decide where I'm going to keep you on as my steward, as my manager, or where I'm going to replace you. So I used to think stewardship and decision making were actually the same thing. But if you look at it, they're actually a little bit different. If I give you a million dollars, and at the end of the year, I ask you, what have you done with my money? All you need to tell me is where that million dollars went. Did you invest it or spend it according to my instructions? So historical cost information is sufficient to discharge stewardship. Here, look, I bought a building. It cost me a million dollars. Okay, cool. That's fine. You spent the money the way I wanted you to. With decision making, though, we're a lot more forward looking. With decision making, we're asking the question, what can we do with this business into the future? So for that, we don't so much care about what happened in the past. We want to know what are the assets worth? What can we sell them for in case we need to reposition our business from making cars to growing oranges? Right? How much can we sell our car factory for? How much can we buy some orange farmland in exchange? So the difference between decision making and stewardship is more about stewardship talking about the past and reporting for the past, decision making helping us make decisions about the future. So there's a little bit about stewardship. The reason we use the word steward, a steward was basically a manager in a medieval estate you know, up until the 14th century or thereabouts. Okay, so we've talked about incentives. 
have a read of Richard Zimmer, Taylor and Wells because those conflicts drive the decisions that people make. And remember, decisions, we'd like them to be making real decisions, but we know that they will be making accounting decisions to make them look good. So these things affect the way that accounting works. Okay, so what about accounting regulations? Who, where do we get the rules from? We know that accounting numbers are important, both for decision making and for contracts. Um, and we know that managers control those numbers. And we know that managers have their own self-interest. So what are we really concerned about here? In setting the rules, we want to give managers minimum flexibility. Because if they have, to, if they have a choice, they're going to choose whatever makes them look better. Now, the problem is you can't take away all flexibility because they need, to rec they need to record what's really happening in their business. And sometimes the rules might be written in such a way that you're not reporting what really goes on if you strictly follow the rules. At least that's what most managers will tell you. Okay, so the rules are there to make sure there isn't too much variety in reporting. Because if there's variety, managers might do some earnings management. Um, okay. Now, this, this actually has some implications. So if managers are reporting efficiently, then what we get is a correct, whatever that means, a rec correct measure of actually what's going on in the business. But we know that managers are driven by incentives. Let me give you an example of a situation where... Um, Okay, where we've got an accounting rule that takes into account incentives but actually gives inconsistent information. Let's assume you have two, ident two almost identical companies and those companies have a brand name. The brand names are both unique, they're both different, but let's assume they have roughly the same value. So let's assume, for example, we're talking about Red Bull and V, okay, energy drinks quarter to nine on a Thursday here, if energy drink sounds right. Um, now, if one, company, if one company grew its brand name, if you create a brand name internally, you are not allowed to record it. And the reason you're not allowed to record it is there's no reliable way of measuring it. If managers create a brand name, how do you create a brand name? By advertising. But advertising does two things. It drives current period sales and it creates the brand. Uh, who knows the difference? Well, if you ask managers how much is an expense, how much is an asset, what do you think they're going to say? They're going to want to make as much asset as possible. Less expense makes profit bigger, more asset makes balance sheet better. So if you give managers the choice, they would prefer to record assets rather than expenses. So with something like brand names, we've said, we know managers have these crazy incentives. There's no way of checking them. So we're just going to say that you are not allowed to record brand names unless you buy them. If you create them, you're not allowed to record them. So let's assume you've got V, created it on its own brand name. You look at its balance sheet, there's no brand name on the balance sheet. Actually, yeah, okay, let's say, let's say V created it. Red Bull also created it. But let, let's assume that Red Bull bought the business. Let's assume Red Bull bought the business from someone else. So they bought the business, they paid for the asset. What else did they pay for? You're not just paying for physical assets, you're paying for the brand as well. So if you pay for the brand, there's a reliable measure. How much did you pay for it? So you can record it. So because we know managers have an incentive to manipulate, we don't let them record brand names unless they actually buy them. We don't let them record them if they've created them. That leads to a problem. You might have two businesses that are very similar. One doesn't have a brand name because it created it. Sorry, it's got it economically. It hasn't got it reported in accounting. The other one's got it because it paid for it. Okay, so the accounting rules reflect the fact that incentives are a bit screwed up and managers would report assets that might not be the appropriate asset. So we just say, because we can't measure this reliably, we won't you record the asset. We won't let you record the asset. So how do we deal with earnings management? Well, we could let managers do what they want. Um, there is an argument that says this might be useful. Um, if markets are efficient, allowing people to negotiate by themselves can be useful. Um, Akalov had an article about the market for lemons. By lemons, what we mean are used cars. Now think about what happens with a used car. If I go out there and I want to buy a car, let's assume 50% of cars are shit. So and a, a shit car is worth 5,000, a good car is worth 10,000. So I go out there, I want to buy a car, 
I don't know whether a car is good or not. On balance of probability, it has a 50% chance of being bad. So I would probably pay 7500 for it, right? The expected value of that car. However, if you own a car and you know it's good, you would have an incentive to get a report to prove it's good to prove your 10000 And that way, if you got that report, I would pay 10000 for it. What would happen? Everybody who had a good car would get a report. Everybody who didn't have a good car would not get a report because it's not going to change the value of their car. So progressively what would happen is all the good cars would have reports, all the bad cars would not. So the market would solve that problem. Okay, that only works if you make certain assumptions about identical assets, everybody's able to assess probabilities correctly. That's not what we see out there in the real world. Companies are different. And making those probabilistic assessments is actually pretty hard. So to suggest that a market solution works for individuals is probably not a sensible argument. And in fact, it's not just about solving problems for individuals. It's about solving problems for society. We as society want resources to be allocated as efficiently as possible because it means wealth is created for everybody. So if people don't feel confident making right economic decisions, not only are those people going to suffer, but we as an economy will suffer because the economy won't be as efficient as it could otherwise be. And that won't be able to fund the things that a well-performing economy can fund. So there's probably a good argument for saying that accounting rules are a sensible solution. Trying to get people to report um, almost the same way, or as close to the same way as we can, will help people make decisions. Now, okay, so we set these things called accounting standards, but we know there are still some choices, and we know those choices will be exploited. But at least we have a little bit more certainty, even though there is some management discretion. Okay, so who are the regulators that set these rules? Well, I've already talked about the Australian Accounting Standards Board and the International Accounting Standards Board. That's where the accounting standards come from. I've made a few comments about those. Um, enforcement of the rules. If you're a listed company or you're a company that's not listed but has listed securities, you offer securities for sale to the general public, then your accounting reports need to comply with the standards. And ASIC, Australian Securities and Investments Commission, is there to make sure the law is enforced. If you've been reading anything about ASIC over the last two years or so, you'll probably come to the conclusion that they're probably not that good a regulator. Um, they're probably not enforcing as much as they can, and they are probably letting some companies get away with things. So who knows? There might be some changes in the way that these things are regulated. Um, I'm sorry this says Australian Stock Exchange. It should say Australian Securities Exchange. The name changed almost 10 years ago, probably more. Um, why does the ASX care about what companies do? The ASX is a private company that operates the stock market. They make money from people trading. So they want to make sure that if you trade, you feel comfortable trading. In other words, if you come to the market, you want to make sure that the only reason the person selling you stocks or buying stocks from you is doing that is because they have different opinions than you, not because they have different information. If they have inside information, then you will not feel comfortable about the market. Right? So one of the things the listing rules from the ASX care about are insider trading. If you have inside information, you have to either say to the stock exchange, stop, tra stop trading our shares until we sort out this secret thing we're organizing so that no investor can take advantage of another investor, or you have to announce that information to the market. So those listing rules are there to protect investors because if investors believe that other people in the market have better information rather than just different opinions or liquidity needs, then you won't feel comfortable trading because you think you'll be exploited by the other person. And the ASX makes money from running an efficient market. So they have an incentive to actually have these listing rules that require companies to disclose risks and disclose information. So that's where listing rules come from. What about the accounting standards? If you're a company or an entity with securities offered for sale to the general public, you need to comply with the accounting standards. The accounting standards are developed out of the framework for financial reporting but they're enforced by the corporation's law. Now, I said that in Australia, we use the same standards for everybody. So if you're a company, you're legally required to follow the standards. If you're not a company, and you don't offer securities for sale, the Corporations Act has got nothing to do with you. But the Institute of Chartered Accountants and the CPAs say if you're a CA or a CPA, and you operate in a company that 
sorry, you operate an entity that doesn't have to meet the Corporations Act requirements, you must, as part of your professional responsibility, follow the accounting standards. So if you're a company, you're required to by law. If you're not in a company, you have to do it by professional responsibility. And if you don't do it, you'll get thrown out of your professional body. So essentially, those standards apply to everybody for those reasons. What is the conceptual framework? I mentioned the statement of accounting concepts before. That's part of the conceptual framework. Basically, the conceptual framework is there to tell us what accounting is about. So one of the things the conceptual framework does is it defines assets, liabilities, revenues, expenses. Hopefully, if we have those definitions, our accounting standards will be consistent. People can look at the conceptual framework and they can understand what we mean by asset and what we mean by revenue. Sorry, I'm laughing, and the reason I'm laughing, two reasons. Um, firstly, there are some standards that are inconsistent with the conceptual framework. And if you talk to most accountants about the conceptual framework, they'll go, what? Let alone other people. Most people don't care about the conceptual framework. The only people who really talk about it are the regulators. And even then, they sometimes come up with standards that are inconsistent with the framework. Okay. So the framework does a bunch of things, tells us what accounting is about. It also tells us what um, characteristics accounting information must have. So it's got to be understandable, it's got to be relevant, it's got to be reliable. Um, it doesn't use the word reliable anymore. It's, I think it mean, it's now called faithfully represents. But I've put reliable because it's got less syllables in it. Comparable, so information is presented the same way in different years and different companies. So you can actually make a sensible comparison. Um, tells us constraints on those characteristics and tells us what assets are, what liabilities are. So hopefully we know what we're seeing when we see an asset reported or a liability reported. Okay, I think all the rest of that is sort of blah, blah, blah. The regulation, harmonization, no, that's probably it.